Okay, so I'm Noel Kinley Side from the University of Bergen and Bjorkner Center for Climate Research. It's my pleasure to bring to you this exciting side event of the All Atlantic 2021 conference. This event is on the future of the Atlantic Ocean, in particular on forecasting ecosystem functioning from microbes to fisheries. The realities of climate change are affecting our lives through extreme weather and its impacts. Climate change is also affecting our lives, uh, effect, greatly affecting marine ecosystems through habitat loss from the tropics to high latitudes. In such a, such a changing world, it's essential to properly manage other human, human activities, such as fisheries, which can push the ecosystems uh, to collapse. So during the next 90 minutes, uh, we, we shall present how four EU funded projects listed below uh, are developing the capabilities and knowledge to help manage human, human activities to ensure a sustainable future through forecasting ecosystem functioning from microbes to fisheries. This is a multidisciplinary effort. This multidisciplinary effort is an excellent example, I believe, of how EU funding is supporting the implementation of uh, the Belém and Galway statements. <clears throat> so, so yeah, I will shortly give the floor to uh, Ziggy Gruber to give some opening remarks. After that, we will have uh, four short presentations, uh, which will discuss various aspects of the, of the, from the projects, covering uh, integrated ecosystem assessments, observations, modelings and modelling and predictions, back to the human dimensions. Then uh, a panel of prominent scientists uh, will discuss uh, the relevance and uh, of you know, of this forecasting approaches to stakeholders. Yeah, and uh, before we, and there will also be an opportunity for the audience to uh, ask questions through the YouTube. So before we formally start, I'd uh, like to go through some housekeeping rules. So please keep your cameras and microphones off for the speakers while you are not speaking, and please, turn both your camera and mic off when you on, sorry, when you are presenting. Please uh, keep your camera and microphone off during the first presentation part for the panelists. Please turn both your camera and mic on when the, during the second part, during the panel discussion, when the uh, panelists, please mute yourselves when you are not answering a question, but keep your camera on. And viewers and audience, please send us your questions uh, by using the chat function on YouTube. Uh, and attach your name uh, to your questions. And with that, I'd like to pass the floor to uh, Ziggy Gruber. So Ziggy Gruber needs no introduction. Uh, until very recently, she was uh, the head of the Healthy Oceans and Seas Unit at the Director General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Many of you will know her for her leading contribution to the Belém and Galway statements. Now she's the, an active uh, senior advisor to the European Commission, Director General for Research and Innovation. And with that, it's my great pleasure to, to give the word to Ziggy. Ziggy, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Noel and Nilgun. Thank you, Noel, for these nice words and for inviting me. Needless to tell you that I'm very happy to be there with you, albeit only virtually. So good morning, good afternoon to all of you, the coordinators of the project, the partners, and all the audience participants. You already listened yesterday to John Bell, who conveyed so many messages, and it's always complicated to talk after him. Let me share now with you a couple of more personal considerations. And for that, I took the leitmotif of this event here, connecting, acting, cooperating. When we started this journey about 10 years ago or longer, research teams worked mainly in the North Atlantic with some more bilateral driven interests between research teams from country to country, such as cooperation, for example, between Ireland and Canada. Look where you are now. Even cooperation amongst the different research teams was not a given until a couple of years ago. It's now, and you're here, and it's not always easy, but possible. And you really all contributed to create that incredibly motivated, dynamic scientific community that now exists along and across the Atlantic Ocean. A community that's also open to engage with others, to grow by sharing results. 
open to access your own cruises, look into opportunities to train young people and provide them with completely new experiences. You can be really proud of that collective inspiration and the mutual trust that together we started to build and now are delivering so many tangible results. Your work, the different new models, the new data you collect, it will be so important to inform new predictive capabilities, not only for more research efforts, but for the communities, for the fishermen who need them so much, but also for the policymakers. Acting comes with accountability and it comes also with responsibility. This event here, the overall Azores event, brings a new momentum. It's also now linked to the overall call for action. Whether this call for action comes from the European Commission, from the UN, from your own countries, from the NGOs and young peoples, we are all running out of time and it's either we act now or never. So it's quite symbolic that this event takes place in the middle of the Atlantic. And I'm really sorry that I am joining here you from the Azores and you could not join it. But today, one of your research cruises is coming back to the island of Horta. What a great achievement. And it's the Portuguese Minister of the Sea, Ricardo Santos, who will be there to celebrate this achievement. So even in the middle of the pandemic, you managed to continue this important work. And it's thanks to your belief that connecting researchers with the knowledge they produce and share between the North and the South with a pole to pole dimension now was stronger than all the constraints put on us during the pandemic. The pandemic has shown us how important it is to continue to act with science integrity and make sure that people continue to trust in science. That what you now will deliver actually corresponds to their needs, co-creating, co-implementing and co-delivering with citizens at large should and will not hopefully be empty passwords anymore. And that is also what cooperating means, to act and work together for a shared purpose. What has been achieved until now by the ongoing work that you do in your projects is also by connecting them with many other projects, with the joint actions funded by the Anchor project. All this is going to bring a new dimension into the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance and at the level of ministers and policymakers there will be a stock taking of the achievements and there will be now an embarkment into a new vision for the next 10 years to align the work, this ongoing work with the future, for example, Horizon Europe mission and the UN decade. And as to the UN decade, we will follow up with all of you in an attempt to harvest collectively the achievements and not to present them individually to the IOC as contribution to the decade, because together we can also act as a model on how we can cooperate in one sea basin and this can be then exported to other sea basins at a global scale. So I wish you a really good work today and in future. I hope you will share my belief that your deliverables will make the difference, not only for science advancements, but really for the people who most need them. And by that, I mean that nobody is left behind. So all my best wishes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ziggy. That was uh, very nice to hear your powerful, encouraging and inspiring words. So with that, I think we move on to the next part of the program. So I'd like to introduce uh, Astra Jara. She's a professor at the University of Cape Town, uh, South Africa. She currently holds the Chair for Marine Ecology and Fisheries at UCT, and she's working in the Triatlas project. So please, uh, Astrid, go ahead. Thanks very much, Noel. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on how you are. Um, I have been asked to, to try and frame this presentation um, or this, this session. And I just want to start off with saying, well, what we're actually trying to do, as Sigi also very kindly reminded us just now, is we are trying to move towards 
sustainability of the entire Atlantic Ocean region under global change. I have a problem with my screen here, I'm sorry. Um, cheers. No, no, it's, I can, heavens. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so sustainability, um, we are mandated through the Berlin Agreement um, from 2017 between the EU, South Africa and, um, and Brazil. What happened now? Um, we, do mandated by that statement, um, we can do joint research on key common areas of interest, including climate variability, ocean observations, forecasting, food security and fisheries management, and also ecosystem approaches, with the attention to achieve better monitoring and forecasting, improved human health, and sustainable use of marine resources. So, if we think about management in a modern way, it firmly puts humans as integral parts of marine systems, obviously including the Atlantic Ocean, um, called marine social ecological systems for that purpose. Um, people alleged as to, as, as you know, um, large unsustainabilities. Um, so the current thinking is that we need to integrate strategies around four dimensions ecological, social, cultural, economic, and institutional governance. And obviously to, to manage towards sustainability, we need a good understanding within these dimensions, but also across. So management is an inherently interdisciplinary task. And we are living under global change. So we also have to be adaptive in our approaches. There are several integrated concepts in, um, in, in approaches. Um, ecosystem services from the 1990s, um, Bob Costanza's work. Then that was developed further into what is now called Nature's Contribution to People under the auspices of IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It is carried out in IC Strategic Initiative on Human Dimensions, um, in the IC SPICE, so Northern Hemisphere Marine Social Ecological Systems work. Uh, NOAA in the US and ICs are conducting integrated ecosystem assessments and we'll get back, back to them. The nature's contribution to people approach in particular um, phrases the, the need to manage human activities to conserve, restore, optimize, depending on the case, regulating services, provisioning services, and cultural services in a changing world. Regulating services, that's your general ecosystem support, everything the oceans do for us. They provide habitat, they regulate climate, they regulate acidification, they provide carbon sequestration, they provide food, energy, feed, medicine and materials, but they also provide inspiration, learning, experience, identity and options for the future. And we have chosen to use this view as a framing for the session. So my colleague from Brazil and also my colleague from France who are going to speak just now are going to speak a little bit about the data and the um, forecasting methodology and needs um, concerning the more regulating services of, of the oceans. Then my colleague from Denmark will talk to the provisioning services. And then I will come back briefly and talk a little bit about um, cultural services and the human dimensions, as we say, in this changing world. So with that, over to Uga. Thank you, Astrid. So Hugo Sarmento, he's a professor at the Department of Microbiology at the University Federal de Sao Carlos, and he is working at the Atlantic ECHO project. So please, uh, Hugo. 
Good morning. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, I do. Thanks for the opportunity and for the presentation. So my name is Hugo Sarmiento, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the Atlant Atlantic Ocean Observation Systems. Okay, so ocean observation today uh, relies on, on, on autonomous systems such as these buoys that we see here, but also in research vessels, research cruises to maintain these buoys that need uh, to be replaced every now and then, uh, which, and this requires international cooperation. Uh, Pirata uh, system is a good example of this, is a set of buoys maintained by several uh, projects from different countries. And it is extremely important to have this information. It, it records mainly uh, data from the physical ocean, temperature and things like that. And this data is extremely important for, for, for predictions, short-term predictions and long-term predictions. Uh, for example, Brazil, uh, where agriculture accounts for approximately one fourth of GDP and 40% of exports, it is now possible to predict uh, production several months ahead and also to choose the best crops and the best timing to plant thanks to these systems. So with this data, uh, we are now able to produce these uh, models of the physical, of the movement of the ocean, which is this video we see here. It's, a, it's results from the models. Uh, but how do we link that to fisheries? So differently from the terrestrial systems where plants uh, transport the nutrients from uh, and water from the soil to the, to, through their roots, in the ocean, the primary production relies on ocean currents and water movements. Uh, we can see uh, we can see that from satellite images, as you see here in green, uh, is the image from the satellites of of uh, primary production in the ocean. Another big difference is that the primary production in the ocean is made by microscopic organisms, which is known as the plankton, and we. Uh, but how do we link that to fish? So to the diversity, abundance, or biomass of fish. So we use also models uh, where we take several variables, like, uh, for example, in this graph, you see the abundance of the organism of the plankton and the size. And it's nice to see that also the most abundant organisms are the smallest ones. And from that, integrating also human activities, such as fishing, shipping, mining, and petroleum, we can get to fisheries, to predict fisheries. However, uh, this reality, uh, the reality is far more complex, especially when you take into account multiple stresses such as climate change, overfishing, and pollution. Okay, in this graph, it's what we call the marine carbon pump where, as I told you before, the physical mixing of the water brings nutrients from the deep to the surface where there is light and a set of microorganisms grow and make primary production. This is called the microbiome, the ocean microbiome. It works like a superorganism and it's the link between the ocean physics, physics and fisheries. So if we want to improve our prediction capacity, we need to know the set of species that is there and to understand their interactions within the microbiome and their ecology. Because microbes work together, the microbiome uh, works like a network, like a superorganism. So why is it important, the microbiome, for humans? First, uh, the ocean microbiome makes up then, uh, more than 80% of the biomass. As you saw, microorganisms are the most abundant ones in the ocean and produces 50% of, of, of the oxygen that we breathe. And it also provides essential 
ecosystem services like carbon sink. Uh, the ocean is the main carbon sink of the CO2 we emit to the atmosphere. It also, it also regulates climate, supports ocean life, channels pollutions, including plastics, and supplies food for our food. So ultimately, the microbiome uh, is the basis of all the food that we take from the ocean. And it is the link between climate and higher trophic levels for fisheries. So in this graph, in these maps, you can see uh, the latest efforts on exploring the microbiomes in the ocean. This video shows uh, our work in research vessels sampling the, the microbiome, in this case is the tire oceans. And in the middle, you can see uh, the existing observation in plastics and plastosphere, which is the microbes that grow on plastics to degrade it. And in the right, the observation exists, uh, the existing observations of carbon flux for carbon sequestration. Several, uh, there are also uh, several projects on, on, on this initiative will gather all the existing data from the Atlantic and make it available and use a friendly way. So we propose a holistic circular approach, uh, integrated approach from genes to fish stocks and markets via the, uh, the data science from physics to molecular ecology and modeling from the sea to the labs. So understanding the microbial interactions and all the different, all the range of behaviors within this microbiome, integrating carbon exports and exchanges of gases to the atmosphere will help us to understand the ecosystem's biology and ultimately fisheries. So we can bring them to the lab and then make some cultures and some bring some hypotheses and together with computational models and, and biological and ecological networks will uh, help us to improve our predictions. There is also a new reality in the ocean, which is the amount of microplastics. In this picture, you see a piece of plastic colonized by a microalgae, diatom, and several bacteria here. So these particles are uh, co colonized by microbes, which integrate and affect also the microbiome. And we need to integrate this in the, into our models. So uh, these projects will generate a new generation of observation systems, which will give us opportunities to, to new ecosystem modeling approach. Uh, we need a 4D observation in space, time, and depth. And some efforts have been carried out to improve that. There's the Ocean Sampling Day, where several places around the world sample the ocean in the same day. But we need to develop more efforts in the south. Also, citizen science. This is uh, private sailor boats that have a kit that we provide to sample the microbiome for us but also the development of new sensors, genetics and imaging systems to improve our knowledge on the microbiome. And then we have also computational uh, work to do to design these interactive networks and to make a new ecosystem modeling approach. This way, we'll be able to evaluate and predict the effect of these changes on the entire networks. All projects adopted best practices concerning data sharing, open data and open science. These are the logos that you can see here, uh, where website, uh, web systems, where the data is available for society and for the researcher community. So if you allow me to make some uh, take, -home, take home messages, oceans observation is essential tool to produce short term and long-term predictions, and it is directly linked to nations' economies and well-being. Ocean observation today relies on international cooperation to carry out research cruises and to maintain autonomous systems such as buoys that measure mainly physical parameters. More recently, efforts have been made to characterize the ocean microbiome, 
uh, the interacting microbes, which is a key link between the ocean physics and fisheries. So if we want to improve our prediction capacity, we need to understand the microbiome and to integrate it into new ecosystem modeling approaches, which requires new observation systems. And this should be better distributed across the ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo. So our next speaker is Juliette Minot. She is a senior researcher at the Institut de Recherche pour le Development, IRD, currently at working at the Laboratory of Oceanography in Paris. She's working in the uh, Blue Action Project. I'd just like, before she starts, I'd like to remind the audience that if they have questions, please post them on the YouTube channel, chat. Thank you, Juliette. We can't hear you. Juliette, you're muted, I think. I deeply apologize for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So um, thank you very much for this introduction, Well, and um, I would like to now take a, a little uh, bit of a, a focus on the modeling side of uh, from, from taking from Hugo's presentation. And uh, I would like to show you a little bit uh, where, why do we believe that uh, environmental predictions at the decadal timescale is needed? So uh, predicting the environment uh, uh, over a horizon of about 10 to 20 years. Uh, why is it a challenge and where are we at the moment? Um, as you can see from this first slide, uh, my, my, I, I work uh, personally a lot uh, in collaboration with uh, Senegalese uh, researchers and Senegalese stakeholders. So uh, several of uh, the examples during my presentation will be taken from my activities in this country. So in, in this country, um, yeah, so predicting, predicting, making uh, environmental predictions. We can consider these predictions at various time scales. If we think about tomorrow, weather forecast, we know that, I mean, each of us make use in general on a daily basis of weather forecast. And this here, uh, the example that I'm showing here is, is a, a, a forecast uh, produced by the National Meteorological Agency in Senegal uh, for, for fishermen, uh, giving them some information about the, the sea state for the coming day. So that's the first aspect of what we can do in terms of marine prediction at very short time scale. If we now go towards a slightly longer time scale, so we can consider seasonal predictions. And this is again here um, uh, an extract from um, uh, pr uh, seasonal predictions provided still by the National Meteorological Agency in Senegal, which gives every year around May, you see this is dated from 7th of May, an indication of what is expected for the coming uh, monsoon season. So the monsoon in Senegal typically starts end of June, early July. So here we have a few months in advance, some indication of what, of how the monsoon season will be in, in, in the coming few months. And at the very end of the scale, of course, uh, most of you have heard about climate projections that are typically provided by uh, uh, IPCC uh, initiative, or at least analyzed in the I IPCC report. And this is uh, an example of uh, predictions of uh, precipitation over Sahel, so, so uh, uh, this region integrating, uh, among others, the Senegal country. And in, in this case, you can see that what we expect for the future mostly depends on the scenario, scenario of expected emission of, in particular, greenhouse gases. And you can see here uh, predict, uh, projections where, uh, depending on a scenario that is business as usual in terms of emissions or a scenario that integrates some mitigation of our emissions. So yeah, over this scale, we have different types of predictions and projections. On short time scales, what is most important is to know where we are now. So physically, the prediction is based on what is the state of the environment, or, of the environment today and how it is going to evolve in the coming days or months. At the end of the scale, in the projections, it's not so important to know the state of the climate now. What is most important, as I have tried to underline, is how the uh, external conditions, conditions external to the, to the climate system itself, emissions of greenhouse gases, which depend on policies, which depends on economics, how these will evolve. And this is why we talk about the boundary limit problem. It's not directly a, a matter of the climate system itself, but what happens around it. And now, what are decadal predictions? Decadal predictions are a challenge precisely because they lie 
exactly at the, at the boundary of these two types of predictions. So physically, they imply knowing both about how the, 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 the um, uh, emissions are going to evolve, what are going to be the trajectories, the, the politics, the scenario that are expected in terms of emissions, economical development, but also what is the climate state today? What do we know how the climate is expected to evolve over this time scale? So you can see that Dekel, this is the reason why the Keller predictions are a challenge for scientists. But of course, this, I mean, you can see that this, this time scale is, is very important in terms of planification, in terms of evaluation, because this is more the political time scale. What can we do now to anticipate a change in the coming decades for a, a, a given country. So when we say that, why do scientists hope at all to predict anything at this time scale? I say it is a challenge. So why do we think there is some predictability? This uh, figure that I'm showing here shows uh, time evolution, uh, an attempt or three attempts to reconstruct time evolution of the Sahel precipitation since uh, the mid 19th century. You can see some uncertainty. Not all reconstructions give exactly the same trajectory. And of course, but basically what you can see is that there are decades or series of years where there has been high, high precipitation, heavy monsoon seasons, like in the 1940s, 1950s, and then followed by decades in the 1980s and 90s, of course, uh, as you can see here, with a relatively weak monsoon, low precipitation seasons. And as illustrated uh, in the images below, these modulation have, of course, a strong impact on daily life uh, of, for, the, for the populations living in these regions. And what is interesting is that these modulations, scientists have found that these modulations in terms of land precipitation have a strong connection with modulation of sea, of the temperature of the uh, oceanic surface, in particular in the North Atlantic. So the time series below is a time series taken from the ocean, observations of the temperature at the surface of the ocean over uh, this, a similar time period. And you can see uh, as well modulation of decades of relatively cold and relatively warm North Atlantic Ocean that are in phase with the modulations that we see uh, in terms of precipitation. And it is because we have this connection and because we have this low frequency modulation that we hope we can predict something because by predicting these slow variations over the ocean, we hope to be able to predict uh, uh, land uh, indicators that are crucial for the living populations. Now, going back into the ocean, I would like to give another example of modulations at the decade time scale, and namely uh, upwelling systems. So upwelling is a technical word but it simply means regions in the world where, for some physical reasons, there is uh, an upward movement of cold and very rich waters coming from the deep ocean, reaching the light at the, at the surface of the ocean, and which, is the, the, which can be the location then of very intense biological activity. This kind of phenomenon appears along the coast of Senegal, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, fishery is, is uh, very active and very important for Senegal. And this time series that I show now at the bottom is again a little bit technical, reconstruction of this physical phenomenon uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so. And you can see again that even this oceanic phenomenon is varying at the so-called decadal time scale with periods of 10 to 15 to 20 years of relatively strong upwelling. So fishery will, uh, yeah, fishery will probably be a relatively abundant and decades of relatively weak upwelling intensity and probably less fishing activity. So you can see, of course, that for local development, it, is, it would be crucial to be able to uh, predict this kind of phenomenon. And of course, the question is, how is this going to evolve in the coming 10 to 15 years, which is precisely the planification timescale? So how could we do these, these predictions? To do these predictions, first, we need uh, comprehensive numerical models. Why do we need models? Simply, I mean, partly because in order to predict the future, we need to integrate the equations of nature that we know into a model to compute them into the future. But as I said, decadal predictions also requires a strong knowledge, a very good knowledge of where we are now. What is the climate state today? 
This is why we also need detailed climate observations as uh, presented by Hugo just before. And the, the, the principle of numerical climate predictions is to uh, uh, take both outputs from numerical models together with the information of these in observations into very powerful supercomputers in order to uh, uh, um, uh, make these, uh, these, uh, these predictions. And what is interesting is that the, the set of uh, European projects that we are talking about today is precisely uh, focused on developing different aspects of all these uh, required elements for the decal predictions. Where are we? We can predict some aspects of the North Atlantic, at least in terms of physics. This is an example of um, uh, a prediction. So in blue is the prediction of a temperature anomaly over the North Atlantic. And you can see that it's a prediction starting in October 1993. So on my time series, you see that before 1993, I have observations in black and uh, in red, the models that have been adjusted to observations thanks to the computer I was mentioning just before. And starting in 1993, this is a retrospective prediction. So we believe we don't have uh, observations anymore and we perform this prediction in blue. How successful was this prediction? We are able now to validate it because we have observation for this year. And you can see that the prediction was relatively successful, at least in terms of predicting this increasing trend of the temperature anomaly over this set of 10 years. So what, what, where are we? Environmental predictions at the decade time scale are a challenge, but they are absolutely needed for planification. Some physical aspects of the climate can be predicted, but they are still, I mean, these predictions are still the focus of intense research in order to increase skill, reduce uncertainty, and increase reliability of these predictions. Are we ready to perform integrated marine predictions? I will leave now the floor to my colleague Mark Payne, but basically the step now is to have a very profound understanding and modeling of the links between the physical aspects of the system that I have just uh, talked, uh, talked about and uh, biogeochemistry. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Juliette. So now let's move over to Mark Payne. So Mark Payne is a senior researcher at the Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen, and he is working in the Mission Atlantic and Blue Action projects. So please, Mark, go ahead. Thanks, Noel. Can you see the, see the screen okay? Yes, perfect. Great, thanks. Uh, so my name is Mark Payne. I'm a senior researcher at the Technical University of Denmark here in Copenhagen. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the work that we've been doing looking at developing marine ecological forecasting as a new and very exciting and powerful tool that can be used to support both climate adaptation and with coping with the challenges of a changing and variable climate. And when you hear the words marine and forecasting together in the same sentence, you probably think of something like I've, I have shown you here on the, on the screen of a, of a vessel setting out into, into stormy weather. And of course, the thing that you're, you're hoping when you see a picture like this is that the captain of the vessel, that she's gone in and she has a good weather forecast sitting behind her, and she knows that this is a safe and defensible um, thing to do. But this is just an example of one of, of many different decisions that need to be made in the marine sphere and that are strongly influenced by the physical environment and where this type of information can play a role. To give you a, to think about that in a bit more detail, I'll actually repeat the exercise that Juliet did um, of placing these, uh, thinking about timescales running from days and weeks over on the left-hand side out to decades and centuries on the right-hand side. And so we can place some of these decisions that need to be made onto this timeline. So the example that I just gave you of, of industry operations and of, is it safe to go to sea, that's very much the domain of weather forecasting and, and we're, we're very much familiar with that. At the other extreme, when we start to think about um, questions around resilience and sustainability and will there be fish stock here in 50 or 100 years. Um, we're, so climate science and the climate community is very good at, at doing these sort of decadal and centennial types of um, projections that can be used to inform about resilience and sustainability questions. But up until recently, many of, there are many, many decisions 
that um, we didn't have this information for, and particularly on these intermediate timescales. And I've put some examples of those types of decisions up. You can have think about investment in, in new gears and new technology processing plants, and how you monitor a fish stock, how you manage a fish stock, setting quota for the coming year, how many people do I need to employ uh, for, for the coming year? These, these types of one to three year type of decisions. And all of these decisions are influenced by the oceanic environment, amongst other things, and need information to support them. But up until recently, as I said, this wasn't possible. But this is actually where climate predictions can now start to fill this gap. And so the, the question then is, how do we actually take these predictions? These are, of course, of, of uh, variables of the physical system. How do we actually turn them into something useful and build ecological forecast systems? Hugo gave us a very nice introduction to the idea of, of observations and of how we can actually measure the state of the ocean, particularly the physical state of the ocean. And then Juliet showed that these can be linked into uh, computer models to give us actual forecasts of the physical state of the ocean, of temperature and salinity. But then if we want to go further, we actually can take the types of biological observations that Hugo also mentioned, couple in our knowledge of marine biology, and putting all these three things together actually gives us the ability to start to think about how we forecast fish and how we start to make societally relevant and focused forecast products that can be used in, uh, in decision making. What you can see in this diagram is there's a very, very clear continuum where we're starting from data on the left hand side and we're turning this into information that can be used to support decision making by tailoring it to the needs of, of specific users. I'm going to give you one very, very concrete example of, of how this can be done and how this type of process could potentially be used uh, in the future, um, and, and in fact, already today. Uh, the example that I'm going to take is the so-called Great Mackerel War. If you're not familiar with this, um, this international uh, conflict, um, this was a dispute between the EU uh, Norway, Iceland, and Greenland over rights on, on who has rights to fish on the North Atlantic mackerel stock, which is a very valuable and uh, a very large commercial fish stock in the northern North Atlantic. And what essentially fueled this was uh, climate change enabling shifts in the distribution of, of this particular species. Uh, the top figure that I have here shows the distribution of mackerel catches around Iceland in 2006, there essentially weren't, weren't any noticeable catches. But in 2007 and then following, and we have, we can see here in 2009, there was a substantial shift in the distribution of where you find the fish from Norway, westwards across the, the Norwegian Sea to Iceland, and in fact, all the way to Greenland and to west of Greenland by 2011. And when Iceland and Greenland um, and other nations started fishing on this particular resource, this led to a large international dispute that gathered a lot of attention here in the, the Scandinavian media, but also internationally. Um, and it has been described by some as the most serious conflict between Scandinavian nations in the last 200 years. But this is just one example of a climate change driven shift in the distribution of fish. And we expect to see many, many more of these in the future as well. Um, but the question that we, we could have want to ask is, could this actually have been foreseen? And could we have actually planned a way around this and potentially avoided this conflict if we'd known it was coming? So what we've done is we've taken an ecological model of the habitat of mackerel. This is simply uh, to characterize the, the regions of, of the North Atlantic that are suitable for mackerel. Um, and, and in this case, it's to show that they're warm enough. And we're looking specifically at, um, around Greenland. On the horizontal axis here, we have time running from 1990 up to 2020. And on the vertical axis, we can have the area of mackerel habitat around Greenland. And we can see from 1990, um, there's been a, a systematic increase in the amount of, of habitat by nearly an, an order of magnitude in the amount of water and the area of water that's suitable around Greenland. And so if we think back to 1990, uh, and this, this is clearly supported and, and underpinned this distribution shift. If we think back to 1990, a very forward-looking manager 
um, could have then sat there and asked the question, well, we don't have any mackerel with us now, but is this something that is actually feasible in the future? And, and could there actually be mackerel turning up on our doorsteps in the future? And so she could have taken these questions to the climate science community, and particularly to these types of models that we have today, assuming that existed back then. Um, and she could have asked that question. And the result that she would have got would have been something like this, where we see uh, the models predicted uh, essentially uh, an expansion in the habitat amount of habitat of mackerel in this region. And indeed, that's exactly what was observed. And then again, in 2010, when the mackerel actually started utilizing this habitat and turned up around Greenland, the logical question to ask, particularly looking at this time series, is, is this trend going to continue? Do we expect it to decline again? Is this a one-off? How, how should I react to this? And is it defensible to actually invest in infrastructure to actually start to, to utilize this resource that's appeared on my, on my front doorstep. And again, if she'd asked the climate models that particular question, this is the, project, the prediction that they would have made. And they would have essentially predicted that the habitat, uh, amount of habitat around Greenland would have been stable for the coming 10 years. And that's actually also what is being observed. So the conclusion then is that we can use ecological forecasts, we can make ecological forecasts by coupling them to ocean observations and climate prediction systems to support decision making uh, in a changing and variable climate. But this is just one example of one particular fish stock, one part of its life history in one corner of the North Atlantic. We've got the proof of concept, then how do we go forward? And there's essentially three things that I, I really want to highlight and I hope that you take home that we need to do to really exploit the value of this tool. The first is that we need to make sure that this is driven by the needs of society and not necessarily by the capabilities or the interests of science and scientists. We need to make sure that the users of these forecasts are actively involved to, and ensure that um, the science is meeting and, and addressing their needs. Secondly, we obviously need to broaden the range of applications. We need to take it to places where there is high ocean dependency, such as small island developing states, such as, as Cape Verde here. We need to spread it across other species and to other biological responses to growth and phenology and recruitment, as well as distribution of, of organisms. And we need to figure out how to actually start to use this information in a, in a management and a climate adaptation uh, context. The IPCC in its um, most recent report on on the oceans highlighted the value of these tools, but doesn't really give us any idea on about how we actually should start to use these in a practical context. And this is something that we very much need to, to think about. The, and the other aspect that is, is also going on and particularly within the triatlas uh, context is that we're actually moving, aiming to move beyond not just the, the single organisms and single responses, but actually to start to look at essentially at the synthetic type of ecosystem approach, taking a holistic whole system approach by coupling not just ocean and atmospheric models, but also biogeochemistry and the full ecosystem component. And this has the potential, if it can be made to work, to really um, give both seasonal and interannual decadal predictions of ecosystem development as well as the centennial types of projections that we're more useful, used to. So if I sum up, there are three main points that I'd like you to take home. The first is that we can actually do this and that we can make ecological forecasts on seasonal to decadal timescales for some stocks in some regions of the, of the North Atlantic and the world. And that we can actually potentially use this as the basis for early warning systems and to support climate adaptation. But the key to all this is society. We need to make sure that society plays an active and key role in guiding and shaping the scientific development of these forecasts to ensure that they actually meet the needs of users and stakeholders. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll pass the word back to Astrid. Thank you very much, Mark. So Astrid will take us back to the human dimension. Please go ahead, Astrid.
we can't Is hear you yet. Well? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. I, I should be. Uh, I'm trying to get into presentation mode. Yay, here we go. Um, so, yes, let's try to put people back into the system explicitly. And I'm having the same problem as I had a minute ago with being able to switch slides or rather not. Not sure how I solved it then. There we go. Um, so I was I was talking about integrated system, uh, concepts and systems approaches, and we have now heard two talks of Hugo and Juliette on the regulating services. We've had a talk on provisioning services. So so how do we now put people in the system? And to do that, I would like to take you to those integrated ecosystem assessments that were pioneered by NOAA and are now also forming a large part of the work in ICs. Um, integrated ecosystem assessments. The first stop in, in predicting anything is to see what's there. Um, so in Blue Action, for example, um, there is important stakeholder involvement in extensive case studies, including scenario work. In Mission Atlantic, um, the IC's integrated ecosystem assessments are being rolled out for the entire of the Atlantic. Um, they are using the ODOM approach, options for delivering ecosystem-based management. Um, but that approach at the moment is quite biased to the natural sciences still. Although Mission Atlantic also has extensive work with stakeholders in the various case studies. In Triatlas, we are trying to, to complement what is currently being done in the IC's integrated system, uh, ecosystem arena with a methodology for indicators of social vulnerability to change in collaboration with NOAA. Um, and of course, the, the Galway Agreement comes in extremely handy there in allowing us to, to do that easily. Um, in Atlantico, they are taking a, a, um, a slightly different approach, also a very globally known approach, also very integrative, the Ocean Health Index. But since I am working in my Atlas myself, let me just show, share with you what we are trying to achieve with these indicators of social vulnerability. What you're seeing here is a map of the northeast coast of the United States from the Canadian border over um, Cape Cod to Cape Hatteras at the bottom. And each of these dots represents a fishing community. Um, they have developed a whole suite of social indicators of how those communities are doing. I've chosen here one um, that is commercial fishing reliance. And what you see is that, especially um, in the north and, and then also around Cape Hatteras, there is a very big diversity of dependence, continuing dependence on commercial fishing reliance. Some of the communities have low dependence, the green ones, some of them are in the middle, the, the yellow and orange, and then some of them are still very high. And when you access the website, you can click yourself through a whole suite of indicators. You also can go through through integrated assessments and saying, well, what, how, how is the social vulnerability to change in those various communities? What I would like to draw your attention to here is a matters of scale. As natural scientists, we are trained to, to work at the scale of an entire ocean. We're doing global models. We are doing basin scale models. We are doing ecosystem scale models that then are bounded by the stuff that's going on basin wide. Um, and for management policies, for international agreements, the scale is important. But when you put people into the system, the management is important. It is the single harbor and the single slipway where the rubber really hits the road. And in continuing this, uh, conducting the set of projects, we are learning how to not only span those temporary scales that my colleagues have spoken about, but also to work across these spatial scales that we have not necessarily been trained to do. Yeah, so in two or three years time, when, when our project concludes, I hope to present us with a similar map of what is happening in South Africa. Um, the colleagues at NOAA are 10 years ahead of us, um, but South Africa is one of the societies that has the data to, to do something similar. And in doing it, we are 
creating a template um, for, for how those social vulnerability can be assessed in countries that do not have quite the data richness of the North. Once you've done that, you can also compare regions. For example, we've done that here for a region um, in the South Brazil Bight and in the Southern Cape and South Africa, where we've looked at small scale fishing communities, handline fishing communities. And we've looked at um, vulnerability and we have found that comparing a whole suite of indicators, um, there are a few things that are really common to wherever you go and which side of the Atlantic you are, but there are also important differences. And this comes in very, very valuable if you are trying to get your mind about adaptation strategies to global change. Because the question is, how does this global change pan out locally, the scale stuff again? Um, but then also, what are the needs of these communities? As Sigi has said, we need to get our science to the people who need it most. And that is very often the people in those small coastal communities who do not quite have the means to, to buffer the big changes that, that we are beginning to see and of which we are expecting more. So taken together in the suite of projects, we are very fortunate to, oopsie, to cover, oh wait, what happened now? You still see, see my screen? We could see your last screen, yeah, a slide. Okay. No, you've gone, gone past. Good heavens, what has happened now? The, You're seeing it now? Yeah, we can see your, yes. We see the one okay, that says, yeah. thank you. Okay, right. There. So in the in this in the suite of projects, we are we are very fortunate to cover a number of case studies around the Atlantic. Um, Blue Action, um, very much in the north. Um, a number of very detailed case studies in the in the data rich um, European countries, geared at those integrated ecosystem assessments. Um, the Galician coastal fisheries will, will be the, the European case study where the um, Ocean Health Index is going to be done, um, apart from a, a, a whole coverage um, on a grid of Atlantic um, areas. And, um, and we have coastal case, case studies in Northeast Brazil, on the central uh, southern Brazil shelf, and also in South Africa where we cover a range from small scale fisheries to artisanal fisheries, for example, on shrimp to also offshore fisheries. And then we have a global case study um, in, on tropical um, Atlantic tuna fisheries, mostly the econo in, in, in econ economics, but also how this is now driven by the climate changes that, that my colleagues have, have detailed. Um, the project partners have collaborations um, to, the, to, to Cape Verde um, in the Gulf of Guinea and then of course again through the Galway Agreement with Atlantic Canada and, and the, the east coast of the states. And, and so I'm really excited about the learning curve of working with stakeholders, working with coastal communities, working across geographical scales now basin to slipway that we will learn um, from, from our experiences in the set of projects. And that will hopefully take us the, the, the kind of things of the human dimensions that we are not quite as good as tackling it. Um, which is this, this, this very intangible thing of cultural services. Um, the inspiration, the learning, the experience, think tourism, um, the identity, what does it mean to have a deep relationship to the sea? And of course, the options for the future. Um, sustainability is all about um, keeping the op options open for future generations. So um, ocean literacy, making, making people aware of the diversity on the ocean, of the, of the importance to, stay, to sustain life, of course, is at the very bottom of of going towards sustainable. Although those services are very, very important, 
they are not as readily quantified as, for example, those social vulnerability indicators that, that I have spoken about just now. Um, but I'm confident that the relationship with social scientists that we are building in, in the suite of project that is presented in the session will also make it easier for us in the future to, to get our minds around how to get those cultural services, those very intangible but nevertheless extremely important services into the predictions and the forecast that we need to make in the changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Astrid. So now we move over to the panel discussion. So I'd like to hand over to, to Tulani uh, Makalani Anne, who is uh, <clears throat> he's the deputy director of the Center for Microbial Ecology and Genomics at the University of Pretoria, and he will be uh, moderating the session. So Tulani. Thanks, uh, Noel. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. So as Noel has just said, I'm Tulani Makalinyani from the University of Pretoria. I'm a microbial ecologist working in the South Atlantic as part of At uh, Atlantico, one of a series of EU supported projects aimed at improving our understanding of the Atlantic. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion. We have just heard four really excellent uh, overviews um, and all of these center on the urgency of managing human activities to conserve, restore, and optimize various ecosystem services in a changing environment. We hope over the next 40 minutes or so to have an open uh, discussion and we'll attempt to contextualize some of the presentations and put them within a wider sustainable development framework. So at the start of the presentation, there was a very uh, excellent reminder about the Belem Galway statement, which guides our research. Um, and this was accompanied by, of course, a very excellent summary and inspirational uh, note uh, that uh, Siggy opened up uh, the discussion with. So one of the things that I took from her statement is the line that she mentioned that at the end of all of these discussions, no one should be left behind. So our guiding statements, um, as captured in the Bellem and Galway statements, both emphasize the critical need for joint research among the countries working or uh, along the Atlantic. So these areas are in four key areas, and they include an increased focus on understanding climate variability, ocean observations, food security, and ecosystem approaches. So some of these key areas sound like very academic exercises, but we should remember that the main reason, as uh, Sigi reminded us, is ultimately to improve human health and well-being. So to everyone who's listening to us online on YouTube, please remember to send through your questions. And you could also, I suppose, also um, um, uh, tag the All Atlantic uh, uh, page on Twitter if there are any questions that you'd like to direct to us. So as you've noticed, there's been a, this afternoon a very overwhelming amount of information uh, from the four talks that we've had. And it would be hard to, to summarize these without um, oversimplifying what the speakers uh, communicated to us, but I'll give it a try. So in the first uh, presentation, Astrid stressed the importance of managing human activities in the ocean. She discussed the various dimensions uh, of what she termed whole of system management um, of human activities in the Atlantic. So the second part of her presentation stressed the fact that the projects presented here contribute towards new knowledge in social, cultural, economic, and institutional dimensions. The very informative presentation by Hugo emphasized the importance of ocean observations as a tool for gaining seasonal and multi-annual uh, uh, predictions in order to understand or predict the effects of long-term climate change. Hugo also stressed the need to improve our prediction capacity and the centrality of the microbiome, which underpins uh, interactions in marine environments. 
So Hugo's presentation also stressed the importance of attempting to integrate microbiome data in new ecosystem models. Another excellent presentation by Ju Juliet stressed the challenges that are associated with environmental predictions at a decadal timescale. The presentation emphasized that physical aspects of climate can be predicted using current methods and that these directly benefit society. So Juliet, from what I understood, emphasized and stressed a lot um, the development of integrated climate and marine ecosystem predictions in a new research frontier, so determined. And this will depend, of course, on our ability to understand and model the physical and biogeochemical links are occurring in the oceans. So finally, or in conclusion, Mark stressed the fact that ecological variability can be predicted on seasonal and decadal timescales. So his talk emphasized that this could be a basis for early warning systems and for, for understanding climate adaptation. So Mark stressed as well the key role that society has in guiding and shaping the forecast. So to unpack uh, some of these points, we, we, we have put together a very exciting panel of experts with a broad range of interest. So I might butcher people's names, so forgive me for that. Uh, Jeroen Stienbjerg, and I'm using the Afrikaans version of your name if that's not correct, is a software developer from Ecopath. Jeroen works, uh, work focuses on ecosystem model development. He has been working on food uh, web modeling since 2005. And as research interests focus on the application of techniques to facilitate and empower environmental sciences. So Yeroen co-leads wor uh, work package uh, in the Triatlas project. We also have Monica Mulebert, who is a biological oceanographer based in Brazil. Monica is a leading expert in the field and her work includes research on animal telemetry and top predators and using top predators as sentinels for environmental change. Monica is currently an investigator on the Triatlas project. So we were meant to have uh, Michael joining us, but I understand that Michael is not here. And finally, we have Romina Henriquez uh, from the University of Pretoria. Romina is a molecular ecologist and she is currently a coordinator of the International Biodiversa Project. Hopefully, I said it correctly. Um, and as part of her activities in GenClime, um, which is a project that's aimed at providing an understanding of evolutionary and socioeconomic consequences of shifting distributional ranges in commercial fisheries, Romina is intricately involved in marine research on various aspects. So as you will see, our panel is very diverse. We will try and have an open discussion with as little jargon as possible. However, with specialists, it can always be expected that there will be some terminology and where possible, I'll ask everyone to uh, try and simplify their language so that everyone listening to us online um, can better understand. So as we mentioned earlier, the point of this panel is to discuss some of the main uh, points uh, from the presentations and to try and contextualize these in the wider sustainable development framework. And maybe I'll start off by asking um, our panel and we'll go through everyone on the panel to first start off by just giving me their thoughts or impressions on the presentations that we heard to today. Monica, if it's possible, may I start with you? Sure, thank you. Good morning. Uh, um, first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge the owners of the land we live and inhabit as a tradition to uh, our culture and uh, to pay respect to the elders. Um, that is a, a common practice that I think we, I, I must uh, take. But moving on, 
uh, I think it was very impressive, the talks we had. It was very interesting. And to see how far we've been, we've come. And uh, uh, it's very uh, encouraging to see that we do have uh, a bright future ahead regardless of all the, the challenges that have also been pointed out uh, in the talks. Um, I would like to focus particularly on gaps because I think it's important to keep them in, in mind. And uh, uh, we will have gaps in observation, in knowledge that will focus in capacity development and sustainability of observations and to continue the work that we are doing, uh, but also in integration and collaboration connection. Um, and that the most important thing is for us as scientists to try to reach out to policymakers and stakeholders uh, to make sure that we can continue to do this outstanding work that has been uh, shown in all the, the the, the, the presentations that we, we've just seen. And I guess if we think about the framework for ocean observation and uh, the, the principles that we've been, uh, fair principles, best practices that have been mentioned in many of the presentations, I think we should try to think about developing uh, essential observations for human interactions as well as pointed out by um, Astrid. So maybe a, a big challenge will be to develop a set of variables pretty much in the, the line of essential ocean variables that would be adopted in different regions so that we can compare and better predict and project uh, the, the great work we've been doing. Thank you. Thanks, Monica, for those comments. Um, and thanks for that very nice overview. So, Romina, I'm interested to uh, hear your thoughts and how you, um, um, you know, took in all the presentations, particularly from your vantage point as an uh, ecological or molecular ecologist. Um, hi, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, I second Monica's uh, comments in which these were fascinating talks in which we are talking about an integrative network of multiple projects and multiple ways of observing the system that is the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, from a molecular ecology perspective, I think one of the gaps like Monica was talking about is this missing genetic information that also needs to recurrently be, be recorded. So it's important besides all these physical and biogeochemical modeling systems to start having maybe a genomic library for all these species and all these interactions. Um, Ugu have, was one of the talks that started including this with this genetic monitoring and genetic sensors for the microbiome. Uh, so it's quite exciting because I think we are in this frontier of knowledge where knowledge is getting better, it's getting more accessible, and then we need to start really including other sources that are more genomics as well. Um, but yeah. That's super interesting, uh, Romina, and I'm interested in exploring your ideas around a genomic library. Maybe we'll have time for that later. Yeroon, what did you make of today's uh, presentations? Yeah, impressive. I'm, uh, it is very good to, uh, to hear that. You know, yeah, there's a lot to be done, but we've done so much already. Uh, I think what uh, Monica said, yeah, of course, it is about capacity building. It's also making sure that the knowledge that is accumulated in countries with adequate funding gets transferred to the countries that maybe not are so fortunate, because those countries also tend to be in the place where the biology hotspots and poor management get concentrated. So there is still a lot to be done. And from a personal pet peeve, yeah, how, how can you make people actually listen to science, right? Of course, we've covered a lot of ground. Astrid um, especially highlighted that by getting people that make decisions or people that are at least interested by the outcome of science involved in the shaping of science. And I think there is still also a lot that can be done. Um, 
I wish to make one point to the presentation picture to Mark, where this 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 beautiful fish appeared off of Iceland. It is important to know that this fish came from somewhere else, so it didn't just materialize and made the world a better place. Uh, things is, everything is connected, so we have to also make sure that we keep a holistic approach to to how things change and how things develop. But all over, I think we've covered so much ground, and there's so much more exciting things to be done. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, that very nice summary. I'm not sure if the speakers are still with us. Um, uh, if they are, um, Mark, uh, would you perhaps also like to uh, respond to what Yoon has just uh, mentioned regarding the fact that the species do not appear in any, uh, well, in the environment and come from somewhere else. So in other words, uh, I think what he's trying to say that there might be a misinterpretation in terms of what you suggested, we got, especially regarding the fact that when there are winners in, in climate change, there are also win, uh, losers as well. It's, that's right. And, and the point that, that the two of you make is, is exactly correct. Um, it's important to remember, particularly with that mackerel example, that those fish that were being caught on, in Greenland and in Iceland and have been caught as far north as Svalbard are uh, the same genetically and biologically and management, the same unit that's caught in the Straits of Gibraltar by Portugal. Um, so that, that might, might seem like a small uh, fight in the, the northern part of Europe actually has um, impacts for essentially 20 countries all across Europe. Um, fisheries management is, requires multinational cooperation. And we, we have to remember that at, at all times. We can't do this on our own. Thanks, Mark. And I'm pretty sure Romina must also have some, <laughs> some comment or feedback in terms of uh, uh, your interpretation, especially from her vantage point. Romina. Um, yeah, of course. So as Mark said, you have one described population that ranges from Southern Europe all the way now into Svalbard, which is fascinating. Um, but what we have been finding out now with the advances in genomic sequencing is that even in marine species that are widely distributed, you start, you actually have micro population structure. You probably have some populations that are be that might be better adapted to some, some environments. The levels of connectivity between these wide ranges might not be as widespread as we thought. So the field is also moving to try and include this information because if you have micro adapted or locally adapted populations, you might then get a mismatch between what's coming into a new area and what's adapted to certain characteristics of the environment. Um, it, 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 from my perspective, this is a fascinating time because we are looking at the redistribution of, of, of species and all these processes that took thousands, millions of years to develop are now playing very quickly. Thank you. So, so this, this is all pretty interesting. I can see a situation easily where we go into a scientific debate, um, but maybe I'll, I'll ask you uh, to segue back um, to the Bellum and Galway agreement. Um, um, Romina, maybe you could get us started and maybe help us think about how these projects have helped advance our understanding of um, knowledge or insights in the South Atlantic in particularly, um, and, and what this actually means for the ordinary person on the street, because they might hear all these terminologies about genomics um, and evolutionary changes, but it's quite difficult sometimes to see how all of these scientific uh, research disciplines fit in and how they actually make a difference um, to them in real time. Um. Hey, I'll, I'll try and give it a start. We've all talked about the one ocean, right? And, and oceans are connected and fish, fish can swim in theory. They can, they, in, according to their physiological limits, of course, but they can. So you might have resources that are shared through different countries, for example, in the Eastern Atlantic for sure, but you have resources that are shared transatlantically. Um, the more information we can provide 
the better we can develop these policies. So the Belay Initiative and the Galway Statement, these are fascinating mechanisms that will enhance collaboration across the Atlantic. And I'll give a short example because I work in the BCLME, the Bengala Current Large Marine Ecosystem. You have three countries, so not a lot, Angola, Namibia, and South Africa. And in the west coast of South Africa, so in the Atlantic coast, you have shared stocks and shared resources. Um, one of them, and the most valuable one, is the Cape Hakes, that in Europe we also love to eat. In Portugal and Spain, I think most of the frozen Hake actually comes from Southern Africa. Um, and you have quotas and you have management policies that are different between Namibia and South Africa. And that works well if you actually have different populations. But if you have one shared population or one shared species, then you have to start thinking about transboundary cooperation, transboundary policies, which is something that has been happening in Europe for quite a long time, but it, it clearly needs to be expanded. So the, I think these projects provide us with the opportunity to, to find common ground and to find ways of, of doing this. Yeah, so I, I, I lost the connection a bit, but I, I think I got the gist of uh, your comments. Thanks a lot, Romina. And maybe one of the links that you mentioned was the transboundary cooperation. Monica, as a, a very skilled uh, researcher working on a diverse range of projects, and particularly as a scientist based in Brazil, can you give us a sense of um, how the uh, Bellum and Galway Agreement has advanced oceanographic research in your country specifically? Oh, thanks, Tulani. I guess most importantly, uh, it's the what we get from all this that has been presented before very brilliantly and for the future is the interconnectivity of everything. And that is key, not only across basins that will be uh, related to sharing resources, all kinds, but also in terms of um, environments. Uh, Juliet's presentation was very, very good in connecting the ocean to the inland in Senegal. She gave a brilliant example. Ugo could have said similar things about uh, Brazil. And I'm sure Mark pointed out the need to connect all that with a transboundary resource like the macro example. So the important thing is to connect different uh, viewers or different environments, as well as different perspectives. So we need to make sure that stakeholders and policymakers understand what this is all about. And I think that's the biggest gap and maybe one of the greatest challenges, which is to make, to get outside our boxes and make sure that everybody understand how interconnected this all is. And this is very uh, much a reflection of what the Belém and Galloway statements, they, they provided us so, so much so that we have these amazing projects presenting these results. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And I think, you know, part of showing the interconnection means understanding um, what is happening in the system from across a range of systems. A lot of these projects are quite multidisciplinary. Could you maybe share some of your thoughts on some of the links that you have been able to make as part of these uh, sister pro or triatlas specifically uh, that you wouldn't have been able to make without uh, these collaborative efforts? Still me or Jorgen? So, so, so for you, Monica. Oh, I, I, I think uh, all the connections, it's just amazing how, how uh, how additive all the, the, the projects have been. And we've been doing different, uh, different uh, we're trying to get different perspectives. We're looking at physical aspects. We're looking at 
the the uh, human aspect, as Astrid pointed out, uh, modeling, uh, trying to connect to local uh, um, to the local communities and fishing villages th through the development of uh, uh, apps to make sure that we have real time information of what's going on. So it is it is very, very interesting in that sense and being able to connect to colleagues in Africa, in Europe, North America and see how um, similar the, the challenges are, even though we have to keep in mind the different financial uh, backgrounds, and I think that's important too. We need to make sure that we understand the reality, the local realities, and the measures that we are trying to propose, because it is very difficult for someone that has has do not has access to uh, electricity. They will not be able to understand or provide infrastructure for um, uh, autonomous. Uh, instrumentation to collect data. So um, these are the, the, the human dimensions that Astrid pointed out that we need to take into account, but that is very interesting in the context of these projects because it gets us connected and let us uh, exchange experiences and situations. Thanks, thanks Monica. So maybe a related question for your room. So as a World Package leader working in Triathlus, you've got partners from various countries. And there's not always like a, a common, um, um, uh, well, start point in terms of the availability of resources. So as someone who's working on software development specifically, how have you dealt with some of these challenges in your project specifically? And what lessons do you think um, can be learned by other projects where there are equal technological inequities? Um, in our particular case, what we did is uh, we realized indeed that people had different experience levels dealing with specific tools that we needed to address the questions. So we started early on, um, especially things got uh, made worse by COVID, right? We couldn't travel, we couldn't meet face to face, we couldn't have the sessions we had planned to, uh, to bring each other up to speed. So we started uh, doing first bi-weekly, later weekly modeling sessions where we brought all the three teams together on Zoom and discussed modeling questions. Um, and it's very educational to, although ecosystems are very different, we were focused on ecosystem modeling, uh, data is different, management questions are different, the principles underneath are similar. So the fact that we could discuss these questions as a group and learn from each other's responses um, that openness in science, I think, is a very good key. That's very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, we share data, but I mean, most of all the experiences that allowed us to uh, yeah, build capacity. And I think actually not having to have face-to-face -face meetings, but ha being forced to connect by Zoom and doing it regularly was more powerful than, than having a one-off face-to-face meeting. So in that sense, we, we learned a lot from that, us as well. Yeah. So that, that definitely does help. So I've got like a... a uh, one last question, because I think we're running out of time, which is a, a controversial um, a question that you've been nominated to answer, Jeroen. Um, so someone asked whether um, you would be able to tell us how, okay, I'm losing stock of the question. Um, uh, if uh, European fishery policy is a good example for the All Atlantic, You shouldn't ask me that question. I'm a programmer. You're going to get a terrible answer. But Monica <laughs> has better to, to say something useful. Uh, Monica. Well, uh, if we have learned anything from Astrid's presentation, we can see it is not, uh, as she pointed out, it's not a, a north-south situation. We have different realities across the Atlantic in all basins. And it, I think it's much more in, uh, a matter of how fisheries is uh, culturally and uh, uh, go the government 
uh, uh, supports it. And it's a, a connection between the cultural and the, the history, historical uh, aspect of fishing. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure one of the challenges that this whole program or the set of the different projects will have is to make sure that the, the, the point, the, the social, uh, let me, the, the social vulnerability aspects that Astrid mentioned in her figure are measured and compare, compared across the different basins. Maybe Astrid could step in and say yeah, something about it because I think it's pretty much her, uh, her side of the, her core. I was here. thinking exactly that, yeah. Uh, Astrid, um, would you maybe like to tackle this question? I think you're probably most appropriate. I, I, I'm happy to also share a little bit of my viewpoint. I think it's, it, it really needs the views of, of several people. But um, yes, Monica, so, so thank you for pointing out that the challenges are different. What um, we in the Benguela definitely can learn from, let's say, the ICES community or the European community, but ICES does a lot of the, the fisheries advisory stuff, is the collaboration on transboundary stocks. Um, the coastlines of Namibia and South Africa are much larger than that of any of the European countries. Um, we are relatively fortunate in the case that a lot of the South African and Namibian stocks keep um, north and south of the boundary, which happens to be an oceanographic boundary. Um, but some don't, um, for example, those Hicks. And, and, and so the, the culture here is that each country does its own stock assessment, its own fisheries management, because most of the stocks are national. Europe has the advantage that most of the stocks aren't. So they've had, had ICs for about 120 years now where they've learned to fight those fights and um, you know, come to an agreement, however difficult it may be. Um, from here, I'm following the Brexit discussions with a big smile, um, but, but there is a culture to come to terms with it. And this is something that Definitely, we in the Benguela can can learn from uh, from countries with so many shared stocks that it can be done. Um, I think what the North can probably learn from us is that it's easier to keep your ecosystems going in a relatively good shape if you haven't quite overfished them quite as badly as some of the European stocks are being overfished. And that maybe, I have to be careful about how I say that now, that maybe um, there is a lot of expertise and a lot of understanding to be um, found in, in the countries of the global south, even if they might be north of the equator, on the stock dynamics, even if they are not in the latest set of models, that shed input on, um, on how hard you can fish them, on how, how um, international agreements, for example, around exporting Southern Hemisphere fish to Europe can be, can be um, formed. Um, so, so I think it's, it's more of a partnership really than many countries in the North, um, like to admit. Thank you. Very diplomatic, Astrid. Um, uh, Mark, uh, I see you also interested in giving this a go. And with the added challenge that it, your answer needs to be in a few seconds, <laughs> I'll give you a, an opportunity to comment. Well, that's easy. I've, Astrid covered most of my points anyway. I think the strength of the European system is that, as, as Astrid mentioned, we've been forced to collaborate because fish do not care about um, ge political or geographic boundaries. Um, and Brexit has highlighted that time and time again, and will continue to highlight that. We've been forced to collaborate. Um, the unfortunate aspect of the European system, however, is that that makes it very conservative and very slow to react and to respond. And in many ways, Europe is actually 
much much further be, uh, behind many of the other West comparable Western management systems, such as in, in Iceland, in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, where it's essentially one country managing one stock. And somewhere in between the, those two extremes, there must be a, an optimal system that maintains the collaboration, recognizes the biology, but hopefully can also be dynamic and responsive in a way that Europe is not. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I think excellent you put in less than two minutes. So I think that brings us all to the end of our panel discussion. Um, I realized the conversation just started to get uh, really interesting and we, we're cutting it off, but I'll, I'll hand uh, back to Noel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tulani. Thank you very much to all the panelists. It was, uh, as Tulani seems to be ashamed to be stopping the discussion now, but uh, we've been going 90 minutes, so I think that's a good time to stop. Uh, it was really nice to be hearing all of the discussion and it was really nice to hear all of these excellent talks and as a coordinator of one of the projects Tritlus, it's really nice to be part of this community that is developing you know the capacity the knowledge the observational expertise and tools to, to, to address some of these challenges and with that i'd like to thank everyone also for listening in and uh wish you all a nice rest of afternoon or rest of day thank you very much Thank you.